complaints of low back pain are very frequent, and approximately 8 out of 10 individuals will have at least one episode of low back pain. It is always important to consider in the history and physical examination other possible sources of back pain. Vascular problems such as aortic aneurysms or other visceral problems such as acute pyelonephritis or penetrating duodenal ulcers, just to mention a few, can cause pain in the low back region and the spine or neurological elements are therefore not the only source of low back pain. In the examination of the lumbar spine, the examiner must again follow an organized system. Inspection, palpation, range of motion, neurological examination, vascular examination, special tests, and related areas. A complete neurological examination of the lower extremities will be dealt with later during this demonstration. Inspection. Start observing the patient immediately, as valuable information can be gained by watching the patient get out of the chair in the waiting room and walk. In order to adequately examine the lumbar spine, the patient should be undressed to underbriefs. It is extremely important to note the presence of any birthmarks, cathiolae spots, hairy patches, hemangiomas, or neurofibromata, as these may denote underlying spinal pathology. Observation of posture during bipedal stance is important. Normally, there are three curves in the spine. Beginning at the top, cervical lordosis, a thoracic kyphosis, and a lumbar lordosis are noted. Loss or exaggeration of any of these curves may suggest underlying spinal pathology. Note any sharp angular kyphosis known as a gibbous. While noting the patient's posture from the side, also look at the abdomen to see if it is protuberant. While observing from behind, assess shoulder symmetry and level, and whether or not there is any obliquity of the pelvis, as would be noted if there was a leg length discrepancy, hip contracture, or spinal deformity. A list away from the midline, noted in patients with a disc protrusion and nerve root irritation, or a prominence of the paraspinal musculature, or loss of symmetry, may suggest spinal deformity. Have the patient bend forwards and note in the normal that the spine remains straight. In the patient with scoliosis, note the asymmetry of the ribcage and the lumbar paravertebral area. Since disc herniation most frequently involves the lower two lumbar discs, the L5 or S1 nerve roots are the most commonly affected. In an L5 nerve root lesion, the dorsiflexors of the foot and ankle may be weak and the patient may have difficulty in walking on the heels because of the inability to hold the foot in a dorsiflex position. Likewise, S1 involvement may affect the gastrocnemius soleus complex and therefore the patient will exhibit difficulty in toe walking. Palpation. Bony landmarks. Begin by sitting behind the patient. Palpate the level of the iliac crests and the line joining the top of the iliac crests intersects the L4-5 interspace and thus the spinous process of L4 and L5 can be palpated and localized as reference points. A horizontal line joining the posterior superior iliac spines is at the level of S2. Having located these reference points, the individual spinous processes should be palpated noting in particular tenderness, deviation from vertical alignment, or a step-off deformity indicative of spondylolisthesis. Complete examination of the sacrococcygeal region should be done at the time of rectal examination. Palpation. Soft tissues. Initially palpate the soft tissues of the low back when the patient is standing. Begin with the interspinous regions again noting any tenderness elicited and also any abnormal gaps between the spinous processes. Palpate 
the paraspinal muscles noting consistency, spasm, or tenderness. Soft tissue palpation should be repeated when the patient is lying prone and relaxed. The sciatic nerve courses midway between the greater trochanter and the ischial tuberosity. It is most readily palpable with the patient lying on the side and flexing the hip of the side to be examined. The cord-like nerve may not itself be palpable, but tenderness elicited in the region of the sciatic nerve may suggest irritation of its contributing nerve roots. With the patient lying supine and the knees bent, a thorough abdominal examination should be performed. Assessment of abdominal wall musculature is carried out by having the patient perform a partial sit-up, and the tone and strength of the musculature can be appreciated. Range of motion. It is extremely difficult to isolate the magnitude of motion in the lumbar spine. During flexion, such as when the patient is asked to touch his toes, motion at the hip joints accounts for a large portion of the total range. I think it is more important to observe the rhythm of the motion of the lumbar spine than the absolute value of motion that occurs and also to note when and where pain is produced. Flexion. The patient is instructed to bend forward and touch the toes while keeping the knees straight. The distance from the fingertips to the floor can be recorded for future comparison, but it is obvious that problems involving one or both hips could seriously affect this motion. It is more important to observe the lumbar spine, noting that normally the lumbar lordosis is flattened during flexion. Schober test. The Schober test is used to assess lumbar spine mobility during flexion. On the line between the posterior superior iliac spines, mark the midpoint. Measure upwards 10 centimeters and mark this point on the back while the patient is standing erect. Have the patient bend forward to touch his toes and measure the distance between the two points and it should have distracted to approximately 16 to 22 centimeters in the normal individual. A measurement of less than 16 centimeters indicates some limitation of motion and flexion at the level of the lumbar spine. Extension. The patient leans back towards the examiner, who supports the pelvis to prevent the patient from falling backwards. The examiner should observe that in the normal, the lordosis has increased, and also note if pain is produced. Lateral bending. The patient leans to one side and then to the other. Difference in range can be measured by assessing the distance from the fingertips to the floor level. Rotation. Stabilize the pelvis and ask the patient to twist to one side and then the other. This may also be assessed with the patient sitting on a stool, which in itself stabilizes the pelvis. Special tests related to the examination of the lumbar spine. Assessment of sacroiliac joint. Pelvic rock test. The patient lies supine and the examiner's thumbs are placed on the anterior superior iliac spines. The palms grasp the lateral side of the pelvis and the examiner compresses the pelvis towards the midline. Any complaints of pain must be localized accurately. Gainsland sign. The patient lies on the examining table with one buttock extending over the edge. Both knees are flexed to the knee chest position. Allow the near leg to be lowered over the edge of the examining table and if pain is produced in the sacroiliac region, pathology may be implicated. Gainsland's test may also be performed with the patient lying on the side and the examiner hyperextends the hip of the free leg with the other leg in the knee chest position. Patrick or Faber test. 
The patient lies supine and places the foot of the involved side on the opposite knee. Now abduct and externally rotate the leg while stabilizing the opposite pelvic crest. At the extreme of passive motion, push down on the knee and opposite pelvic crest and note if pain is elicited. Obviously, hip pathology could well interfere with this test. The Neurological Examination of the Lower Extremities The overall objectives of the neurological examination are to determine if a neurological deficit is present and to localize, if at all possible, the level of the deficit. Since the spine is intimately associated with the neurological structures, it is absolutely essential to perform a complete neurological evaluation. This will include sensory, motor, and reflex examination. The neurological examination is unfortunately somewhat subjective and requires the patient's full cooperation. The neurological examination may be conducted in the following order. Tests for nerve root tension. Sensory examination. Motor examination. Reflex examination. And tests to assess meningeal irritation and increased intrathecal pressure. Tests to assess nerve root tension. The nerve roots are capable of some movement in the spinal canal. If an inflamed nerve root is stretched in relation to a space-occupying lesion, such as a disc protrusion, pain in the distribution of the peripheral nerve will be elicited. The following tests may be positive under these circumstances. Straight leg raising test. The patient lies supine and the examiner lifts the leg involved by grasping the heel. The knee must be kept fully extended. Normally, the straight leg can be elevated approximately 80 degrees or more from the examining table. If a patient complains of pain radiating down the back of the leg from the buttock region to below the knee level, the range of elevation is recorded. For this test to be significant, it is important that the pain should not be localized in the posterior thigh alone, as this is due merely to hamstring stretching. Pain felt below the knee, at least to the calf, ankle, or foot, is more indicative of nerve root pressure. Foot dorsiflexion test. If the straight leg is lowered by only a few degrees from the point that pain was reported, the pain will disappear. At that point, the examiner dorsiflexes the foot, and this will cause significant stretch of the sciatic nerve to reproduce the pain again below the knee level. Bowstring sign. The patient's involved leg is elevated to the point that pain is produced. The knee is slightly flexed and the pain will dissipate. Maintaining the position of leg elevation and knee flexion, the examiner rests the patient's lower leg on his shoulder. Firm bilateral thumb pressure